Zero Carbon Britain. Tell us a bit, if you could, about the the past behind that, because for lots of mm-hmm. people's interpretation, it was probably around before the topic was popular, if you like. Yeah, well, way before the topic was popular to anybody, back in 1973, a group of people colonised a derelict slate quarry that was nobody wanted in Wales. They sort of adopted it and made it into the centre for alternative technology to try and reshape the relationship between human beings and technology to get it to work better for the citizen but within the limits of the planet. And that's CAT, Centre for Alternative Technology, that's progressed and grown over the past 45 years. But round about 2005, a few of us became very concerned of what the data was coming out from the climate science, that this was actually a really serious problem. So we sat down and we began to think, how do all of these solutions that we see around us, loft insulations, solar panels, wind turbines, how do they all clip together to give us a transition plan that matches the scale and speed of the urgency of the climate science. We were following Kevin Anderson from the Tyndall Centre, Sir John Horton, uh, he was the uh, chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He lived nearby and would regular visit. And by talking to these scientists, we realised that the target was actually zero. We had to get to net zero as quickly as possible. Now, back then... We just had the Royal Commission for Environmental Pollution's report. The target was 60% by 2050. That was up to 80% by the IPCC report and the UK Climate Change Act. But it still wasn't anywhere near enough. So we thought, well, let's begin modelling what it would be like to do what the science demands rather than just what politics is saying. So in 2007, we launched the first report in the All-Party Parliamentary Climate Change Group in Westminster And from then on, we've been going to the people we've been engaging with and saying, well, what do you need to know more about? What research do we need to further convince you that this is a viable future path? And people were saying, yeah, well, 100% renewables, how do we really keep the lights on? How do we ensure the hospitals stay powered when it's minus 15 and the wind hasn't blown for three days in the middle of the winter? So we began detailed modelling, looking at uh, hourly weather data over a 10-year average and we came up with a very detailed model looking at energy supply, energy demand, matching the two, what's the gaps, what's the right mix of renewables, what's the right location for renewables. You don't just put them all at the top because it's windier. If you spread them all around the UK you actually get a more equal supply. And we launched that in 2013 called Rethinking the Future, which is a really detailed understanding of what it is we need to do and what it would be like in Britain if we'd done it. So new evidence is coming out all the time, or certainly across that period has been coming out all the time. You obviously felt there was sufficient evidence in favour of a net zero carbon economy 12, 15, maybe more years ago. Yes, the, the science was quite clear that the urgency of climate change, climate feedbacks within systems, see, climate change is a wicked problem, what they call a wicked problem, because there's no single solution, and the problem itself feeds back on itself, that the more it warms, the more we get methane released from Arctic tundras, or if ice melts, the sea absorbs much, much more of the sun's heat than ice does, so it feeds back on itself. So that was what motivated us. And what's interesting is, over that 12-year period, how the mainstream consensus has now moved to net zero being... Uh, UK adopted target that we know we have to go there but it's not really just about what the target is or when it is it's actually about the area under the curve the amount of carbon we release so if we're to have real responsibility towards future generations and towards other areas of the world which are much more vulnerable than we are we have to think how do we get to zero as quickly as possible Let's speak about the UK government first. Um, Has the national government there been receptive, do you think, to these kinds of ideas and this kind of evidence? Well, I think the UK government's receptive in that the Committee on Climate Change, which is the independent body that governs the Climate Change Act, has now set a net zero target. But they also monitor our progress towards the existing target of 80%, and now they'll monitor our progress towards the new target of... 100% net zero and 
if you look at the Committee on Climate Change's feedback, they're very critical of the government that we're, we're not on track to meet the targets for 80%, let alone 100%. So we really need a radical shift in government action planning. Because, of course, it's good that the Commons declared a climate emergency, they recognised it, but that has to be converted into a delivery plan. Now, all across the UK, councils are declaring climate emergencies, well over half the councils and many more plans in the pipeline. But they're also at grassroots level, sort of, from borough councils, district councils, county councils. They're now making plans. They should be supported and they should all be integrated into one national plan with central government support. But we're not seeing that. So we've got a petition on the cat.org website getting people to sign the petition to say to the government, we want to see an action plan commensurate with meeting net zero as far in advance of 2050 as possible. I mean, it's really interesting at the moment. One of the people who's not from the green progressive side at all, he's, he was the ex-chief scientist, uh, Sir David King, is now coming out publicly and saying, I'm scared because the amount of climate impacts we're seeing for this degree of warming is more than our model predicted. So if he's been honest and he's saying we need to bring the target forward 10 years, then we would hope that the government would listen to his advice because he's a, a respected scientist and launch a net zero by 2040 UK Marshall Transition Plan. It sounds as though the political landscape on the Isle of Man loosely mirrors that of the UK. Um, we saw lengthy discussion in the summer in Timwald, uh, where several members put arguments forward that a target of 2035 would be more appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't find favour, or not at the time at least. The time scales you're referring to, it would imply that 2050 isn't soon enough. Is that, is, that, yes. is, that, is that a fair summary? That's a fair summary. That certainly echoes what Sir David King said, the target needs to be brought forward 10 years. So as soon as it is humanly possible. Now, we don't really know how quickly we can do it till we try, but if we set off with real social cohesion behind it, and importantly, look at the multi-solving opportunities, because if we're going to transform things to reach a climate target of net zero as quickly as possible, we have huge opportunities to transform other things, to reduce fuel poverty, to move to healthier diets, to get people out and about moving more and cycling and walking. There's all sorts of things that we can do. I mean, affordable transitions to energy efficient homes with proper support, zero interest loans for people who are struggling, so that we can get all of the buildings in the UK up to a very high standard. We can get the public transport systems working for the benefit of the citizens. We can actually make a better world. We can make a more exciting world. We can make a world that's easier to live in for all sorts of different people. And through doing that, reveal a sense of perhaps common purpose of society uniting around a goal that gives us something important to work towards. In terms of your work and your um, modelling for how this would be achieved, does that factor in costing plans as well? Well, what's interesting is if you look at the costs, I mean, first of all, Nicholas Stern pioneered the understanding of the economics of this is saying it's much cheaper to solve the problem than it is to have the problem bombard itself upon you with climate impacts. It's actually cheaper. But then we look at the investment needed in renewables, in offshore wind or solar PV. Solar PV has dropped phenomenally over the past 10 years. Since 2015, offshore wind, the cost of installing it has more or less halved. They're very, very good value technologies now. I mean, there's analysts predicting that by 2023, offshore wind's going to be comparable with gas. But the other side of it is looking at the fossil fuel costs. What costs are actually externalised that aren't paid for by producer or consumer, like health costs of emissions released by diesel cars or thinking about future adaptation costs that new generations are going to have to pay? Those aren't factored in. If we have a levelised cost accounting, then renewables are already cheaper. But as I came over here from um, from Hesham on the ferry, I was astounded at the huge array of offshore wind that's been installed very quickly. 
I can I can almost see it from where I'm sat almost, but you certainly can on a. It doesn't even requ- require a particularly clear day to see it from yes. the island. But. So if we compare with other islands, like with the Danish island of Samsø, where they've made a transition to net zero, they're actually below zero now, and they did that ten years ago. Is that a sort of comparable populous or comparable size it's of island? It's a bit smaller. It's a bit smaller than the Isle of Man. But I think if the Isle of Man was to be a global leader in island transition, then there's huge economic opportunities in that into being the live lab for how we refit islands. There's many, many islands in the world that have to do this. So why not take the lead? Very, very good wind speeds. And it can have, if particularly if it's owned by municipally, by the government or by a collective in the island, then the maintenance costs can actually be paying for jobs of people who work on the island. So it's not people who are from other countries who do the maintenance. The profits from selling the electricity can go to fund schools and hospitals. It's a matter of civic ownership as well. You've given us some clues towards this already, but why is the Isle of Man of interest to you? Is it because is it because of the scale here and therefore speed at which things could be changed, perhaps? If we think about all of the things that need to happen, because you have a, a defined border because you have a high de- higher degree of autonomy than, say, Manchester or Lancaster, then you have an opportunity to reshape the world as the climate challenge requires. So you could be a fantastic live lab for, for testing things. Not everything's going to be brilliant first time, but understanding what works, what doesn't, and learning from that and building upon it. But I'm actually on tour. I'm on the road most of the time now because the number of requests we get... I'm I'm off to Warwick shortly and then down to London. I've just been up to Carlisle where there was a council emergency declaration and we had a training day for all different councillors. This is happening all over the UK. Tell us a bit more about what's happened so far on your visit. And I'm not not just talking about ice creams Mm. in Peel, but uh, (laughs) the, uh, the, 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 Mm. the reasons for your visit, I suppose, and and what's happening on, on the way. I think, Because there's the recognition of the problem amongst a fair proportion of the population, people are very keen to convert that into a plan for the Isle of Man. Now, we we know that we have a a task force of 15 people beginning to come up with a, a plan for the Isle of Man, so interested citizens have tried to get me involved so I can begin to talk to some of those experts, some of the politicians involved. Part of it is explaining what the zero carbon Britain scenario can offer in terms of if you, if we're going to actually rethink the infrastructure that then has to be in place for another 50 years let's it's worth spending some time doing some detailed modeling to be sure we put our investments in the optimum places but also I think it's it's a matter of cross fertilizing a lot of good ideas from other places as well I spent time on Samsu I understood the cultural change required to get to net zero emissions was difficult for a Danish island. A lot of people, it was very new to a lot of people. So they started with the the blacksmith uh, of the island and with the farming community and really helped them understand that firstly they had to change but secondly there were enormous grassroots opportunities for them to rethink their assets in a different way to begin to deliver for a collective plan the key phrase that I picked out there was cultural change and that seems to be just small sample surveys from social media or from listening Mm -hmm. to certain programs on Manx Radio there are still a lot of people who are very resistant to change and quite skeptical about some of the evidence which is being put before Mm -hmm. them is part of the challenge in bringing the public on board do you think do you think that's that's still the phase we're at i think the vast majority of the people recognize climate change is a problem there's still a vocal minority who will declare that the climate science is inaccurate but that really is a a depleting minority of people now the vast majority of the people in the middle ground accept it but in order to turn that acceptance into action we, we need a plan, and we need a plan that doesn't just solve climate. It solves a lot of other different social 
and economic challenges at the same time. I've spoken at length with uh, former Environment Minister here, Phil Gorn, who, um, whose name is on the document which essentially justifies the exploration for natural gas off the coast of the Isle of Man, which was something like six or seven years ago. The justification for that, or part of it at the time, was that it could bankroll a greener transition further down the line. He's since said that's no longer relevant, it's too late for that, and new evidence from the IPCC in particular suggests that's that's an outdated model now. What do you think is the, the practi- practicable next step for the Isle of Man? I would say the next step is to come up with a, a detailed zero-carbon Isle of Man range of models, not just one model, so you can begin to tweak the model to look at the different mix of energy generation, to look at the amount of powering down what society demands by using energy more efficiently. So that it's not just one model, but it's actually like an hourly model so that we can know hour by hour how we keep the lights on, but also look at what choices create what amount of income for municipal services, for what we all need to gather in terms of schools, hospitals, council services. Because I think having that approach to seeing the wind and the sun as a resource that belongs to future generations, it belongs to everybody. It's not something we should just lease off to Saudi Arabian or you know Arab Emirate developers who come in with money and then sell us the electricity at 15p a unit. It's something that resource belongs to citizens. So if we can set up projects that can harvest it, but also harvest the profit and pump that into ensuring that we have a healthy and and viable lifestyle on the island, then I think that's a a very interesting option. Politically, there is still resistance, and especially resistance about the timescales required and the urgency required to undergo this transformation. How are politicians convinced, do you think? I think politicians need to be need to recognise that there is, amongst the young people, a grassroots surge of recognition from this, and these people are moving more increasingly onto the electoral register, and if you want to be continually viably elected, you have to recognise that this is a wave of recognition. And as we see more events around the world, that will get stronger. This is why millions of people around the world at the moment, in many, many different cities, are locking themselves on and getting arrested because they're scared, because they know this is real. Now, there may be people who reside in safe denial at their air flights or whatever lifestyle choices are are still good, but they are really kidding themselves. I think the science knows this is real and the majority of people know it's real. And if the politicians don't ride that wave, then they'll be crushed by it, I think. Just finally, Tim Wald has appointed an emergency climate change transformation team which is I think reporting back at the beginning of the new year what Mm. sorts of discussions do you think you will be having with that team well I I would like to draw their attention to other islands that have done it such as Samso where it has actually brought a a lot of more social cohesion and collective action and people you know they'll go on camera saying I didn't know half as many people as I do after the plan, because we all came together and did it. There's that sort of social cohesion, multi-solving benefit. But I think there's many examples where places that have done this, they're just better off. It's not that they're burdened with anything. I mean, offshore wind is such a viable investment now that many Danish pension funds are competing to invest in British offshore wind. But much as we like the Danes, it's our wind. Let us invest in it. Let us divest the stranded assets from pension funds and university endowments out of fossil fuels and into our own intergenerational resource. 